This conversation won't scare you. It's 420 and it's time for THC Live. Shane Foxman, welcome to another edition of THC Live, another jam-packed Thursday 40 as we try to uh, break down some of the myths and uh, what would it be, untruths, when it comes to the world of uh, marijuana. We have another absolutely uh, jam-packed show today again, but before we get to that, um, can we run that one more time, please? There was something in the opening that we usually don't have in the opening, and it's really thrown me for a loop. Can we see that one more time? Oh, can we see that? This conversation oh, won't scare oh, you. It's 420, and it's time for THC Live. <laughs> I'm going to assume I'm not on the email, the office email, that I didn't get the email for that. Or I was trying out the new hairdo, a new hairdo, right? It's, you know? It was an interesting look. It was an interesting look. <laughs> uh, tell the folks if they want to comment on that or you, if they'd like to reach any of our You can comment on that, but I guests. prefer you don't. But you can also uh, join us if you're live here. You can comment down below in the comments, and we're going to be asking our guests uh, the questions that you ask. And we are also on YouTube now at thclive.tv where you can watch past episodes, new episodes, small episodes. Different segments in the show, whatever you want to find. So live on Facebook and we live on YouTube uh, as well. As mentioned, an absolutely uh, jam-packed show We do. Uh, today. Our uh, first exciting guest, we have Ross Rebliati, uh, gold medalist, Olympic gold medalist yeah, from 1998. Yeah, everyone remembers uh, Ross's uh, story. Uh, we'll catch up with Ross, find out what he's up to uh, uh, these days as well, plus relive some of those uh, crazy moments back yes. in 1998. Uh, we also have some interesting news when it comes to the world of cannabis. Uh, first, we're going to hear from the chief medical officer in uh, Colorado, of course. Uh, they are about three years into their legalization of marijuana. We'll hear from the chief medical officer, see what's happened in those three years. All the doom and gloom, is that what's happening or, or not? Maybe it's a totally different situation, so we'll hear from him. And the city of Richmond. City of Richmond, they want to outlaw uh, dispensaries. Yeah, retail sales, completely. they want to say no. <laughs> to retail sales. We have our thoughts on that. We'll bring you that as well. And uh, immigration lawyer uh, Len Saunders is going to join us live in studio as well. Uh, if anyone has had an issue traveling uh, to the States, and you know if they ask you that question, have you ever smoked marijuana? Uh, why are you going down to Washington State? You can get yourself in all kinds of trouble. Uh, Len Sand Saunders uh, will be here to uh, help uh, shepherd us through yes. uh, the hoops. Give us the do's and don'ts about border crossing. Exactly. <laughs> but first off, as I mentioned, uh, our first guest really doesn't really need any introduction in this country. But for those of you that might have been born a little bit later, here's a little bit of a reminder. First off, as I mentioned, uh, first guest really it was 1998. Ross Rebliati, a young snowboarder from Whistler, was poised to leap on the Olympic stage in Nagano, Japan. Rebliati was part of a favoured Canadian team. However, he had struggled to find his form leading up to the biggest race of his life. Trailing the field going into his final run of the event, Rebliati laid down an improbable run and made history by claiming the first ever Olympic snowboarding gold medal. Oh, and yeah. Ross Rebliati of Whistler, British Columbia takes over the lead. 72 hours later, the story changed. An announcement by the IOC. Minute levels of THC were found in his system. Rebliati was stripped of his gold medal and banned from the Games. The Canadian Olympic Committee appealed the case and the decision was overturned. 24 hours after the seemingly fatal blow, the gold medal was back in the hands of snowboard's newest hero. Plus, Rebliati's snowboarding friends in Whistler, B.C. are standing behind him tonight. The overwhelming consensus was that low levels of THC in an athlete's system was not an advantage and the clear champion of Olympic gold was Ross Rebliati. A cultural phenomenon in the world of cannabis, Ross is an outspoken advocate and is currently marketing his own strain of weed, Ross's Gold. Rebliati joining us live in studio today. Thanks so much for coming in. It seems like yesterday when we watched some of that tape from 1998. Does it seem like yesterday for you, a lifetime ago, the 20, it's hard to believe it's been 20 years. Yeah, it, it's hard to believe it was 20 years. Uh, 
It does seem like yesterday, though, even though there's been a lot of things occur over the years. Um, but yeah, no, glad to have it be 20 years ago, finally. Right. Yeah. I, I want to talk about obviously what you're doing now and, and things, because things, as you mentioned, has changed. It's been remarkable. Um, but before we leave 1998, what was it like in the eye of the storm in that moment? Like we talked before, you mentioned you were 26, which was probably a lot better than being 19 at that point. It, if probably, I could help at all. If I could just, yeah, definitely. I'm glad I wasn't 19, you know, at, in Nagano. And uh, that the experience that I had prior to that, being on the World Cup tour for seven or eight years, traveling around the world, probably helped uh, in many ways. Having the, the small media exposure that I had, though, to uh, at the time as, a, as an athlete probably helped me out a little bit, too. So... Um, it was intense, you know, it was a 10 out of 10 on what the heck, you know. So it was just a matter of really like deciding that I was going to stay behind cannabis and get behind it and um, legitimize it and create a, an atmosphere where I could be proud of my medal and that Canadians could be proud of it. And so I think, you know, that's been my quest over the last 20 years. How soon after? the whole thing kind of went down. Did you actually decide, like, I'm going to become a gondrepreneur, as they call it nowadays, <laughs> and decide that you were going to start Ross Gold? Well, at the time, I realized the opportunity would, would present itself at some point, and it was going to be a very strategic um, way forward, you know, from 1998 to, you know, where we are today looking at uh, recreational cannabis in July 2018. So... Um, I knew it wasn't going to be overnight, and I did. I, I spent a lot of time working in construction and operating heavy machinery and just working, uh, making ends meet. But at the same time, taking the media request to talk about cannabis, defending the athletes that uh, ended up in the in the media, and and why, you know, athletes would choose cannabis. Why why is Michael Phelps, you know, getting busted with a bong and uh, instead of a bottle of whiskey. And so right, like that know. would have been OK if, if he was walking right. around with a bottle of whiskey at a party. No problem. That's, That's okay, yeah. yeah, but totally it was a bong. Not. So it changed the entire conversation. Right. And so I had to explain why, you know, that was a, a healthy choice at the time. And um, it was taboo to say. And it was, you know, maybe at the time taking a few opportunities off the table for me. And uh, but I knew in the long run that it was the right thing to do. Um, uh, the truth about cannabis needs to come out, um, and I think for me as an as an athlete, as a known person in Canada, that uh, you know I had a responsibility, I had, you know, to bear. Uh, you know, the cannabis issue was given to me on the highest stage that you know the world knows of. Whether you wanted it or and not. And so I felt yeah. very compelled to um, run with that. It's amazing that it can be. It's 20 years later but your name still resonates. And as you said, you, you, know, you knew that an opportunity would come. Uh, again, at some point down there, it wasn't gonna be overnight. Are you surprised at all? Did you always know in the sense of, that again, if I say your name, Ross Rebliotti, uh, most Canadians, especially of a certain age, right away, they know who you are and they take you back to that moment instantaneously. Are you surprised at the longevity of, of, of say, your name or your, you have your to infamy? Be. I mean, yeah. who else? Uh, you can't, I can't think of, I mean, I'm not bragging or nothing. No. But, I mean, it's been um, quite a run, you know. Right. You know, it was hard even in the days when I was walking on job sites, you know, looking for construction work, you know, because even then people knew me. When I wasn't in the limelight, people still knew who I was. And, uh, you know, there was some, some tough moments, some real moments. Uh, but, yeah, it was something that I needed to do. And five years ago, you know, we put it on paper we decided we'd come out with the Ross Gold Company and um, that we would, you know, get behind it from a health and excellence standpoint. Did and, you see it coming? Was that the idea? Like you could, uh, it's hard to tell with a crystal ball because it changes yeah. all the time now. I kind of saw it coming. I mean, yeah. even in 98, we, we already had a medical, like an MMAR program here in Canada. California had already had one going for a number of years. And, you know, with me and... Just like when I tried snowboarding for the first time, I'm like, this is going to be big one day. Right. I knew it. And with cannabis, it's so healthy. It's so good for you. It makes you feel so good. Um, there's no hangover. There's zero calories. I mean, there's really a million reasons why 
cannabis is, is good for you and, and a million things that it, that it can help you uh, out with. Um, so it wasn't hard at all for me to get behind it. And uh, it was just about, you know, me having a family and, and the responsibilities that I had as a husband and a father <clears throat> and to take the opportunities that were there for me. And uh, at the time, you know, it wasn't an opportunity. It was, it was almost like something that was holding me back, but I still, you know, felt like I needed to go for it. And, uh, you know, when I started having a family, that's when I, I really wanted to get serious about it and put it on paper. So, and being ahead of the curve, being yeah. during prohibition, all of that was, was something that I felt was important. So for a lot of people out there, they don't know exactly about Ross Gold. Can you kind of give us a little background to what it is, what you stand for? Sure. Uh, Ross's Gold is a cannabis company, plain and simple. Uh, we have a dispensary in Kelowna. It uh, has over 25 different strains in it. Um, they're not called Ross's Gold, but right. they're, they're, you know, all the most popular strains. You know, we have really high-end packaging. We did a high-end build-out of the storefront and um, we really branded it, um, you know, from a standpoint of where we think cannabis should be. And what, you know, we would like to have people think of our store as something that they should associate to the product as well. And um, that's a departure and, that, and that's something that I'm, I'm proud of and to, uh, you know, help lift the stigma of cannabis and, and introduce it to uh, multiple generations that have been ripped off basically of the benefits of cannabis right now is uh, one of our biggest uh, goals. Do you, you, you mentioned you, you built out the store. We are in that gray area right now. It, it's, you know, 2018 July's coming. We don't really know what's going to happen. Every province kind of will do something differently. A bit of a risk kind of doing what you're doing? For sure there's, a, there's, a, there's always a risk. And I think if there's not a risk, it's not worth taking. And, uh, you know, for me as an athlete in extreme sports and that sort of thing, it didn't, it wasn't that big of a risk for me personally. I think from the business standpoint, from a corporate standpoint, yeah, it was probably a huge risk. And, uh, but when you think about the enormity of, of the industry, like even if our store gets shut down, I mean, can you, just think about how small that is in the whole realm of things. Like right. in 10 or 20 years, we'll have hundreds of stores, if not more than that, and worldwide and, and bigger than that. And, you know, we're looking at an industry that's creating brand new jobs that never existed before, a tax revenue that didn't exist before. Um, you know, there's a medicine that wasn't allowed to be researched, and now it is, and now millions of people are going to have access to it. So there's like a ton of like good news. There still seems to be obviously some opposition to the idea, of course. Um, one thing we always talk about is, you know, they should take the tax dollars, earmark them for specific projects. So people that are opposed to it go, oh, look, they're using the money to whether fix that school, that playground, whatever it may be. What do you think the keys are to help kind of make the transition once it happens as smooth as possible? Well, I think allocating the tax dollars to some social things would be a great idea. I mean, you know, just in BC alone, you know, we have a horrible record with, you know, child poverty and stuff like that. And uh, indigenous communities don't have clean water. There's all kinds of major, huge problems that are, they're like the big, you know, elephant in the room that no one's talking about. And there's going to be millions and billions of tax revenue dollars coming out of the industry that, you know, I know for a fact that the industry would love to see it go to those things and not fund, Just you know, general yeah. revenue, right, exactly. You know, not go into the big, huge whatever it is right. like it should be up to the municipalities i would like to think you know that they would have some say over it and uh, i know there's going to be like a federal 50 percent grab of all of the taxes and and you know maybe that's you know that it's their deal so <laughs> that's what they so get you're to saying do. too you have a lot of seniors that are kind of coming into your shop or that you're working with is that especially you live in Kelowna? do you find that there is a big market or is there I a do. lot that you're helping with in Kelowna? As there well. are. Are um, they apprehensive too when they come in? Because again, yeah. they're from that generation that was told, you smoke the joint, you might as well be putting a needle in your eye. Yeah. Right, this is your brain on drugs, right? right? And it's, um, they're fed up with the pharmaceutical, the costs. They're fed up with the side effects. Uh, they're just fed up, period. And, um, 
they've, they've been hearing through the grapevine because not all of them are internet um, like savvy. Savvy the way <laughs> yeah. you know we are. We research stuff like any second we we want to know something. We just research it, and they like to talk to like five or six different friends and right. kind of you know. So yeah, we've had um, some really great customers come in that are that are senior that are looking for help and just the most simple things that they would normally have two or three different prescriptions to deal with and we can just give them a CBD topical cream that, that penetrates so deep and so strongly that they don't even need their, their pills anymore and um, just also a friendly environment where you have the bud tenders all use cannabis for some reason or they're their child uses it for seizures or something profound, their brain cancer, one of our bud tenders has brain cancer. And so we have really the ability to connect with the people. The real people. You know, working, and yeah. talk to the people in the community. And it's a real, it's a social hub. It's not just a drugstore or whatever, you know, it's, it's somewhere where people can meet someone that's friendly, that's familiar to them. Um, they can see the product and know that it's good if you know in the future they can order it and have it delivered to their house but it's important that they get to see the product and they're not just online looking at a picture who knows where that picture is from yeah. i would so. think people again especially seniors they, they've been told so many things over the years and you believe that stuff because oh it was told me by the government or the official so it must be true mm -hmm. It would be so, they would reach the point of, no, I'm finally going to walk in there. But that would be a nerve-wracking experience, yeah. I would think, for a lot of folks. One gentleman, I literally heard him talking to people on the street about my <gasps> store. And I was, I ride my bike from my place with my medal and put it on display there every day. And uh, I heard this gentleman speaking to a couple of just passer buyers about where the store was, and he started saying why he was looking for it and trying to justify, like, just as strangers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, why? And there's like, and they're like, oh, there's a couple more stores around the corner. And anyways, so I, I just said, listen, I, I heard you're talking about the store. Why don't you come in? I'll show you around. And uh, yeah, because it's a big moment. And it's not just for seniors. Right. There, every day there's someone who's, for the first time, coming to the store who, you know, they might be... 25, 35, 45. It doesn't matter how old they are or what background they, they come from. They're, they're curious and they want information. I, I would love to walk in a store and to see you there. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> like, the, the gold some people medal. like literally can't believe it. Yeah, like, uh, the gold, like, oh, you're that guy? Like, you're the Ross. Some people probably come yeah. in just for pictures, right? And yeah. They hit me up on well, Instagram. We're as driving we through Kelowna. Okay, meet me at the store. It's 20, it's, as cool. I said, 20 years later, you're, it still doesn't matter. I, I don't know how many people I could tell you from the Olympic team in 1998. I'd, I'd be hard pressed. Right. But I'll remember you for sure. Right. It's, Schmerler. It's remarkable. Right. The curler. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> we had, um, oh, we, we just had such a good time over the years. I mean, cannabis is. The, the cannabis community is such a fun, loving, and caring community. And I find them close in it as well. It's very Everyone much like snowboarding, everybody. right? Yeah. You know, like we, we knew snowboarding was going to be big, and, and I feel like cannabis and the snowboard culture are very connected. I mean, the whole ski culture and snowboard culture and cannabis has always been connected. Um, and I feel like, um, like it's just a big family the way the snowboard community was. And, you know, we're just looking out for each other, and, you know, we want to we wanna help people. I think we I got, like uh, you got questions. We do. From we have some viewer. questions Excellent. here for you. Um, Tristina asks, "Have you been affected by raids in Kelowna?" No, no. But they they're doing some store shutdowns on the west side of Kelowna. Yeah. And uh, on the east side, um, it's a different riding. So no that problem. Not that big of a difference, even though it's a municipality. We have a conservative a riding on one side of the bridge and a liberal riding on the other, and so there's a political tug of war going on. Yeah. That was the next question that Michael asked, is what's happening with Kelowna's threat to shut down all the dispensaries in the city? Do you think that eventually... So Stephen like, Furr is the, is the MP yes. for Kelowna. Right. And Stephen, I, I, know, I know Stephen, he's a really great guy. We're lucky that he's our MP. Um, and so, you know, with Trudeau legalizing cannabis, you know, we've, on the east side of Kelowna, on the other side of the bridge, uh, you know, it's been... Very respectful how everything's been going on. And, you know, we've been following the Vancouver situation. We've been following the Victoria situation. And uh, it really boils down to politics. I mean, this is what weed is now a political, you know, 
a hot potato. It's happening. <laughs> I'm just shocked because it usually comes down to money, and the fact that there is so much money at stake, I'm surprised there's still anyone who goes, okay, well, let's just see. Like, Once uh, they get reelected, because there's elections coming up, right. Right? Then, then wait then and see what happens. This is change. all about getting reelected right change now. Change the tune. Yeah. Uh, Ross, thanks so much for coming in today, man. We really appreciate yeah, it. it. Thank you. Awesome. It was a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you. A pleasure. Thanks all. Oh, oh. oh. We'll bring it around. That's it. <laughs> It's the beauty of uh, live Facebook, exactly. Hand, right? uh, our thanks to uh, gold medalist uh, Ross Robledo for spending some time with us uh, today. Uh, it's time to take a little bit of a, uh, a, a walk down memory lane. Yeah, so as we do every week, we have a special segment, and it's kind of funny because it's kind of repetitious in a sense of we, we're getting told one thing, and then the government is kind of giving us what they would like us to believe. So here is the next episode of Growing Pains. Formed in the U.S. in 1970, Normal is a national organization for the reform of marijuana laws, a cannabis decriminalization lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. By 1972, there were 12,000 convictions for cannabis possession in Canada, prompting a spin-off organization, Normal Canada. Everything's under control, situation normal. Perhaps because of Normal's efforts, between 1973 and 1979, 11 states take serious action on the Schaefer Commission's recommendations that marijuana be decriminalized and make possession of small amounts of marijuana legal or only misdemeanors. Meanwhile, medical marijuana is still illegal. In 1976, college professor Robert Randall sues for the right to use marijuana to treat his glaucoma. I'm gonna have to science the shit out of this. Medical science affirms Randall's claims. He wins. By the late 1970s, the Canadian Medical Association says that cannabis is not a narcotic. In 1979, Health Canada releases a secret report calling for decriminalization. Canada's three biggest political parties respond by supporting the reform of cannabis laws, though it's unclear if they really support the reform or just crave the support of millions of registered voters. In 1977, founder of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, Dr. Robert DuPont, publicly favors decriminalization. Given that he was appointed by President Nixon, I'm not a crook, who deliberately buried the Schaefer Commission report, DuPont's position is interesting. Apparently, he did not get the memo forbidding independent thinking. It turns out the U.S. Congress also craves the support of millions of registered voters. They now consider a federal bill to decriminalize marijuana. The effort is dealt a mortal blow when members of peanut farmer Jimmy Carter's administration are accused of using cocaine at drug-fueled parties. It's a classic case of self-inflicted political suicide. No charges were ever filed against the accused. Meanwhile in Canada, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau is re-elected in 1980, due partly to his promise to decriminalize, but yields to new US President Reagan and scraps his original plans. It should have been 38 years ago. Yeah. Exactly. How many times have we seen a report commissioned by the government, whether it be here or south of the border, that comes back and says, you know what, marijuana doesn't lead to violence. It's, it's not, not a gateway, a gateway drug. It's not bad for It doesn't you. lead to anything else. And all of us, the government buries the report. And here, look how close uh, our current prime minister's uh, father was, and that's 1980. Yeah. So, f you know, virtually 40 years ago. But no, our neighbors to the south uh, weren't big fans. So we don't do anything. And yet it it's our neighbors sun, to the yeah. south that end up going first, whether it's Washington State, Colorado, Oregon, and we it's end like up we following. Waiting, we were waiting I know. for them to do that because then it's not our bad. How us, much right? money did we leave on the table? Uh, and, and here, we talked about this off the top, a little bit of a cannabis news speaking of Colorado. So Colorado legalized it uh, back in 2014, so three years ago or so. So now, obviously, with us getting closer and closer to legalization, people want to know, how's We're it working them. in Colorado? What's yeah. going on? So uh, the chief medical officer of health, I want to make sure we get his name right, uh, Dr. Larry Walk. So again, not a, a dispensary owner, not a grower, not an advocate, not someone who's opposed. The chief medical officer of health, just his job to take a look at what's going on. He says, we haven't experienced, this is an exact quote, we haven't experienced any significant issues as a result of legalization. One in four adults and one in five youths use marijuana on a somewhat regular basis, said the doctor, and those numbers haven't changed since legalization. It's remarkable. He went on to say, 
upon the subject of safety, he cautioned against, and this is good for the folks in Ontario, yeah. he cautioned about selling marijuana in liquor stores or bars. The co-use of marijuana and liquor is a bad idea, he said. Marijuana in of itself, or the THC and alcohol in of itself can cause impairment. We know that those effects are not just addictive, but exponentially increased if someone chooses to use both at the same time. So why sell them at the same place? It's ridiculous, actually, if you think about it. Yeah, because it is a kind Mickey of crazy. Like here, yeah, just go and do this, and then and try this, mix it together, bag. and uh, have you know, that's it's a yeah. It's, makes it's no crazy. sense. It Interesting. One crazy. other tidbit from the doctor, just when it came to legal age, how old should you be? He said, setting the legal age for use is tricky because there are both health and practical factors to take into consideration. He said, biologically, we know the correct age should be 25, but he says, uh, if you have the legal age of drinking already, you already have a high prevalence that it may make a sense to align the legal age of drinking yeah. with the same age. With as nine, 19, maybe a little. 19, 21. A little it, too low, I think, maybe. A okay, bit, so that's interesting, right? Everyone's going to have a thought. And, uh, again, we'll tell you how you can get your uh, thoughts uh, heard by the yeah. government in a minute. Uh, we also talked about this city of Richmond. Yeah, the city of Richmond. They are cracking down and they want to outlaw all dispensaries in the city of Richmond, which I don't understand how next door in New West or Vancouver, Vancouver. how it's going to be legal there. That makes no sense that yeah. you can go there and not the other. But I guess it's the people who live in Well, you know what? No problem if you want to do that. And again, if, you, if the city doesn't want to, no problem, but then you have no access to the tax dollars. Yeah. Because again, I, I honestly believe they're going to earmark the tax dollars for specific projects. Hopefully. That's the only yeah. way to help people who are opposed to it kind of come around to the idea. So if Richmond doesn't want to have any dispensaries, you no don't get any of that, those millions <laughs> upon millions of tax dollars. And we'll yeah. see how quickly that changes when you go, oh, look, look at all the new playgrounds in Vancouver yeah. and in Burnaby and in, and in New West and in Coquitlam. And oh, we're not Senior getting any. Senior centers maybe exactly. too, right? They it, could be all kinds of... It's ridiculous. Yeah, I think that, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next little bit with that. Yeah, provincial government wants to hear from you. We've been telling you about their website, right? They want to November know November 1st, they're shutting down. So you have to make sure you get your opinion in, the things, your thoughts. Yeah, there's the website on the uh, screen if you want to go in. What was the number? We Last time we talked, it was 20,000. Now we're at 40,000 40, people have put some input, have yeah. their input have in. Yeah, voice their concern, what they want to yeah. see, pro, uh, con, your concerns, whatever it is the provincial government uh, wants to hear from you. Uh, and by the way, there is no real, it's not, we're not even sure if Richmond can outlawed, if, depending on what the provincial government does. So uh, just something to uh, keep in mind. And at the same time, you shouldn't really be able to choose. It should be, it's legal in Canada. Right. As, those are my thoughts. I think it's once it's across the board, how can you to pick and choose, It shouldn't right? be different depending on where you live. And we are joined here by Len Saunders, who is an immigration lawyer and works, he works from Bellingham in the States, and he is joining us here today to answer some of the questions that we have. Len, thanks for coming in. <laughs> no problem. Uh, you're, ba you're based in Blaine, right? Actually in Blaine, yes. Oh, Blaine, Blaine. Okay. sorry, yeah. sorry about that. Right over the border. About three blocks south. Right, <laughs> so what's the most common thing you hear? from folks. What's the biggest problem people have when it comes to crossing the border? With regards to marijuana yes. or in general? No, let's just go with marijuana. Is being asked whether they've used it in the past. Now, is that just a question? Like, because I cross the border quite a bit going down south. I don't think I've ever been asked that. I find from my experience, it's not somebody who is older, maybe in hey, their hey. 30s, 40s, or 50s, someone <laughs> Perhaps, younger, yes. late teens, early 20s. Er, yes who maybe is driving a van, a Volkswagen van, or there's the some really kind stereotypical. of stereotyping. Yeah. Wow. Exactly, yes. And so they'll ask you what? They'll just go, hey, have you ever, like, so I'm coming in, have you ever smoked marijuana? It seems like a weird question to be asking. It usually starts as a very simple question like that, and if the person answers yes, then they're sent inside the building, or if they're already inside the building, they'll be put into secondary to a small room, and then question extensively about any past marijuana use. Okay, so wait a second. Oh, sorry. So they're not asking if you have any on you. They're asking you if, if you've, you've ever, ever smoked. Tried it. Well, if you have some on you, that's a different problem. That's a which different. I get. Right, yes. but they're not asking you that. They're asking if you've ever smoked any. So you're going there. I might have smoked it three weeks ago and or I, twenty years ago. Right, and if I say yes, all of a sudden they're bringing me in. Exactly. And okay, and, and then, then what happens? Yeah. yeah what, what's the so usually there's an interrogation for anywhere from two, three, four, five hours. Um, there's a very detailed sworn statement because you have to admit it under oath, sign it, uh, be advised of it's an illegal substance, 
and then the person's denied entry and told basically they're banned for life. And when, so that's when they come to you, right? So then Once I get the phone calls they're, they're banned. from the person and I say to them, you will need a waiver for the rest of your life. And unfortunately, waivers are not permanent. The minimum is a year, even though I quite frequently see six months in situations like marijuana admission. The maximum is five years. So I tell people who call me, this may be a lifetime relationship with me because you will need a waiver for the rest of your life. And this is also, it's, it's time consuming to put in your application and it also costs money every time? Government filing work? fees at the border when you submit it, $585 US. Legal fees if you hire an attorney, you're looking at hundreds if not thousands of dollars. And then once it gets submitted, it takes about six months. It takes me about a month or two to put an application together and then another roughly six months to get a decision. Typically, someone gets a one-year waiver, so I tell them, now you can start using your waiver, but we have to start working on your renewal immediately. Wow. It all starts because they ask you a question. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And a, a question that really, you're answering honestly because it, it doesn't seem like a big deal. Do you have to answer their questions? Well, you don't, and most people answer it because they think, well, it's, it's legal in Washington State. What's the problem? So I tell people you are under no obligation to answer that question. What should you say to them then? Yeah. What's the right thing to say? Well, I can't tell people what to say because right. I can't you know, put words in their mouth right. or tell them to lie. But what I can say is if you do not answer that question, the worst thing that can happen is you get denied entry. If you admit that you have smoked marijuana, it's a lifetime ban. So it's a one day, they turn you around at the border then, or it's the possibility of the rest of your life dealing with it. Dealing with that or exactly. coming across and doing waivers. And usually it's a very innocent question, so people don't think, whoops, Ooh. excuse me, people don't think that they are going to be barred. They just think, I'll answer the question, right. I'll be on my way, and no problem. When they get denied entry, they're shocked. I, I, I deal with this at least once or twice a week. And people, These are they, very common. They and feel like a like authority, right? Well, sure, that they but should be you answering said, honestly too. You said it's Washington State where it's legal, the federal government runs the border. Exactly. And there's your difference. You're and disconnect. That's where, and that's yeah. where it gets confusing. Right. And especially now when it becomes legal in Canada, you're gonna have it legal on the north side of the border, on the south side of the border, at least in Washington State. But that little line that divides those two jurisdictions, it is illegal and for in my opinion, for a long time will stay illegal. How many, how many people, how common is this? How often are you getting called so on this? So I started practicing in Blaine 15 years ago. I would see maybe one or two cases a year. When they legalized wash, uh, marijuana in Washington State about five years ago, I then saw maybe one or two cases a month. So it started to uptick. Lately, it's at least one or two a week, if not more. What happens if someone has a medical card? Uh, say it's like an actual doctor, this is their medicine. What if they're trying to cross? So I've seen cases where people have been given by the federal government of Canada a license to grow marijuana for their own medicinal purposes, yeah. and they've had their waivers taken away, or they've been denied entry and told they need a waiver. Even though it's what's Even keeping them going Even though they've been granted it, yes. Wow. How hard is it to navigate the legal system when it's like two different legal systems intertwined? Well, that's the problem. Well, you've got Canada and the US, plus you've got Washington State and the feds, it's... And that's where it gets confusing. And so when people get denied entry and told they're banned for life, the only one who benefits is me. I right. understand <laughs> if someone has a criminal conviction for a past crime in Canada, theft, burglary, something like that. I understand those people, they need waivers, that's the law. But when someone is asked, who's never been charged or convicted of any kind of criminal offenses, and gets asked this question, when it's legal in Washington state and soon to be legal in Canada, it's a colossal waste of time and money. You know, we used to tell people and you used to hear people say if you got pulled over by one of those spot checks or ride programs at Christmas time oh, yeah. on the roads, even if you've had one beer, just tell them you had no beer. As Soon as you said, even if you just had one beer, all of a sudden they're pulling you out of the car. You're, it almost seems, and again, you can't tell people to lie, but it almost seems like the best thing to do is go, no. Because really, they have no way of and knowing lot, anyway. And a but, lot of people, I believe, say that. What yeah. happens if you get caught? Though? Yeah, but how? I mean, you, well, say they find out later, maybe you try to go through again, and you actually have a medical do they card. Keep track, do they keep track of stuff at the border? We always think as probably stupid people that well, when you cross over, you say something, they put it in your file, like there's a file on you. If, if you're sent into secondary, quite often they will make notes. So let's say 
you ask that question and you won't answer it. They'll probably deny you entry for not being cooperative. And they will make a note and they'll probably put a look on you, but chances are the next officer on a different day at a different port of entry will not ask you that. Not every officer takes it upon themselves to diligently enforce federal immigration laws. They have the right to, but most officers don't. When they scan your passport, what do they see? Would those notes pop up or what exactly? Because that's always something everyone's so if, always wondering. What do they If a look has been put on you by a previous denied entry or by a previous officer, then it's an automatic secondary. So you will be sent inside. So I've never seen the screen because I've never worked at the border. Yeah. But from my experience, there'll be a secondary inspection lookout. So you go inside and some officers will read it and say, be on your way. Other officers will take it upon themselves maybe to question you again. My experience is most people who don't answer that question affirmatively, whether they've smoked marijuana, will not be sent into secondary and interrogated a second time. Is it harder to get a waiver for someone who's got a criminal record or for someone who admitted that they might have smoked eight years ago? I've actually only had one waiver denied for someone who has admitted to smoking marijuana, and it happened on 420 this last mm -hmm. year, which really? was kind of ironic. So we just refiled. So my experience is it is harder to get a criminal a waiver for a criminal conviction than a marijuana okay. admission. But who knows, right? I, I'd never had one denied before, and I had one. And what about like criminal records and marijuana charges? Because it's really interesting, once we do turn to a legalized country, how is that going to work with if someone had a marijuana charge like a criminal, and they have a criminal record with that? Well, it's still a grounds of inadmissibility because it's a conviction unless it gets overturned by the federal government. I know Trudeau has talked a little bit about having some of those old convictions overturned. But all it takes is reason to believe. All an officer has to do, like if you have a past charge but not a conviction for marijuana possession or cultivation of marijuana, all it takes is an officer to make their own determination that there's a reason to believe that you're involved with drugs. So it doesn't take an admission. It does not take a conviction. It does not take you know, anything more than reason to believe. Too much control in the uh, yeah. power of the officer at the border. Um, the people that you help are your clients. As, as they're going through the process, you must hear, for, they must go, I can't believe this is all going on. For, like they must really be, some of them must really be beside themselves of all the hoops they're jumping through now for absolutely nothing. For being honest. They also yeah, for honest, yeah. yeah. And, and it's more of a money issue. A lot of people think it's a fee grab that they're being asked so that the US government can increase their revenues. And I said, I don't think so. Um, I don't think it's a revenue grab, but it's, it's a lot. A lot of my clients, when they're younger, they're in school, they're just starting out. And to come up with the filing fees and possibly the legal fees, it's a lot of money. So a lot of people hold off on either filing their initial waiver or renewal. I can't imagine being surprised showing up at the border and going, oh, I'm sorry, you can't. Uh, yeah, your big family you holiday. Yeah, you're on your family, exactly, uh, because of something that it, it is so crazy. Like, again, you're not caught doing anything. I get if you get caught doing something, you should know I better. I agree, yeah. I agree. But if you're not even, I agree. by being honest, they take advantage yeah. of their power of, in the position it of authority, the authority that yeah. you're going to go, okay, well, because we all get nervous at the border. We have nothing, nothing to hide, and you get panicked at the border. Yeah, I agree. It's like going through a roadblock and you're completely sober and you're like, oh, your heart's pounding. <laughs> uh, I feel bad when I'm trying to, like, you know, sneak in the pair of Nikes I bought. I don't want to yeah. declare that I'm terrified, <laughs> let alone something else. Totally. Uh, do we got any... Uh, we do. We have some questions oh, for from you from Excellent. the viewers. So Connor asks, when you get a medical access card, you have to disclose all your personal information, including your driver's license number and plate. Is this information shared with the border? Uh, the Americans have access to RCMP records, so past charges, convictions, but it's my understanding they have no access to Canadian driving records. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. I got another question. Anthony asks, what, what might prompt a border guard to ask about cannabis use? Um, profiling. Younger, you know, right. when I'm at the port of entry helping clients, the people who are in those enforcement lines, they're always younger, they're wearing tie-dye shirts, they maybe have dreadlocks. You rarely see someone in a three-piece suit with a tie in that enforcement line. So a lot of it's, you know, stereotyping, 
someone younger who may be using marijuana recently or in the past few years. Seems how old school that is. Like the whole, the whole movement, some of the movement as far as legalization is really moving forward and there's still some way back here that it's gateway, it's this, it's that. Exactly. And they're the same thing. Oh no, it wouldn't be the guy in the suit, it would only be the guy in dreadlocks. I which agree. is really, like, who are you kidding? Yep, I agree. So we have another question here from Tyler. He asks, what's the difference between a waiver and a pardon? So a pardon is for a criminal conviction in Canada and a pardon is actually not recognized uh, by U.S. immigration. Okay. So a waiver is to waive your, your inadmissibility to the U.S. So a waiver is a U.S. waiver. A pardon is for past Canadian criminal convictions. So, I, oh, sorry. Okay. No, go ahead. Well, I tell clients if you have a past criminal conviction for marijuana possession, there's no point getting a pardon because it's still in the system. The Americans so can still see it through CPIC, through the right. RCMP criminal database. Because a lot of people think that a pardon, that's what you hear mostly of. A right. pardon, as soon as I get a pardon, everything's gone away, I'm fine, still I can travel. There. It's still there. That stuff seems wow. to live forever. It does. Yeah. Than, especially stuff at the border, stuff that we deal with our U.S. neighbors, something, anything happens, it seems it lives forever. I did a waiver once for a gentleman from uh, Aldergrove who had a conviction from 1957. Wow. See, come on. So, wow. over 60 years ago. Oh, thank you so much, Len. Len, thanks for, for coming joining in. We us. really thank appreciate you very much it. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I have a hundred other questions that will come up. We'll make yeah. sure we keep you <laughs> on, uh, on speed dial. Uh, Len Saunders, of course, uh, immigration lawyer. Our thanks to Ross Robliotti, uh, gold medalist, of course, uh, 1998 Nagano Games. Uh, and here we are 20 years later, Ross's gold. You can check him out in Kelowna and maybe elsewhere. Online He's got a bus. Too. He's got a bus. If you're watching us in Alberta, keep your eyes open. Ross's gold bus could be cruising through your neighborhood could be. at uh, any time. Uh, next week on the show. We have Jody Emery. She's going to be coming on the show talking about all of her past, present, and future. And future. Knowledge. Exactly. <laughs> Jody Emery will join us on the show. Also, uh, Terry Roycroft. He's the owner of uh, MCRCI here in Van, uh, well, here in Vancouver, in the Lower Mainland, as we're coming to you from an undisclosed location in the Lower mainland. Uh, they deal with uh, folks who are dealing with medical conditions who are prescribed marijuana to uh, cope with their health issues when traditional methods aren't working. Uh, Terry will join us, uh, I believe, live in studio as well. Uh, yes. Super exciting as well. Next week we are having a studio audience here oh. and they will be... Awesome. It's going to be live questions, so... Okay, could be a lot of fun, yeah. so maybe we'll see you in the uh, studio we next could, week. We could, yeah. Until then, have a great week, and uh, we'll see you next Thursday. Thanks for watching THC Live. <laughs>